so welcome back. Uh, um, so this is the last session of the day and it's the fourth chapter of this story that we are telling about the modernization of the air navigation system. Um, this time I will leave you in very good hands of, of the director um, ICAO and industry affairs at Canso. In this role, he's, he's, he's been responsible for the management of the Montreal office and for the successful leadership and oversight of council relations with ICAO and key industry partners such as ACI, IATA, ICCAI, etc. In line with the vision, mission, goals and objectives of the association. It is my pleasure to introduce to you to Nico Borbach. Nico? Thank you. Thank you, Olga, and uh, I would like to thank uh, ICAO for this event again. I think what we all see is that this session on the GAMP is so important. We have to implement the GAMP, and we have to see how we get this thing forward. Aviation is growing fast, in the, and in many parts of the world, we see that we're running into um, capacity limitations. So we need to be working together and being innovative, innovative to keep the system effective, safe, secure, but also uh, sustainable. And that is why the GAMP is created, to make sure we are ready for the future on a coordinated global way. So let's discuss, uh, continue with the discussions that we have in the earlier panels and see how we can improve the implementation of the, global, of the GAMP globally. Our first speaker is um, Hartmut Kuhlmann, and he will be presenting the Eurocontrol perspective on a performance-based uh, approach. Hartmut is a senior expert with more than 25 years of experience at Eurocontrol. In the 1990s, he was active in future ATM concepts and strategies, so really good for this uh, option. Uh, and he was assigned to the origins of the SWIM concept. About 15 years ago, he started getting involved in the performance subject, first in R&D, CSR context, and later to Eurocontrol's performance review unit. He currently assists ICAO Paris office with the implementation of the Euro European Region Performance Framework. And he is an advisor for the ATM RPP panel for performance matters and works with the FAA and US Europe performance compar comparison studies. Hartmut, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nico. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let's see how this works. Let's turn it around. That's good. So the theme or the motto um, of this uh, particular session is uh, fall in love with the problem, not with the solution. Uh, up front here you see, see a whole row of people who are tasked to do that and I get the first shot at it. Uh, so let's see how this goes. Uh, what I'm planning to do is uh, introduce you to uh, IKEA's general guidance on the performance-based approach. Uh, explain the principles behind the performance-based decision-making method for the GAMP 2019. Uh, and uh, if there's some time left, I'll touch uh, on uh, some uh, food for thought, advantages and challenges. Uh, so my presentation is more about offering you the different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and uh, uh, explain how they fit together, because that will help uh, uh, with putting the later presentations in context. Uh, um, let me uh, start uh, with the big picture. On this slide, uh, for sure you've seen uh, the aspects that I've explained beforehand, but maybe presented in a different way. Uh, on this slide, you see from left to right uh, planning horizons and from top to bottom life cycle phases. Uh, DOC uh, 9854, the GATMOC, uh, sits on the far right time horizon and at the beginning of the life cycle. Uh, the global level of the GAMP elaborates this into more detail with targeted availability dates. R&D, validation, and standards development is part of this as well. When solutions are mature, uh, they can be included in rolling regional and national implementation plans. After implementation, they are used by network planning and service delivery uh, for seasonal planning, 
pre-tactical planning, and finally, air navigation service delivery on the day of operations. Next is performance analysis. In the performance-based approach, data is archived, analyzed, and used to drive planning decisions. The, as you see with the arrows here, they feed back into um, these uh, upstream um, boxes there. Uh, the bottom left rectangle here uh, encloses the part of the process representing performance-driven implementation and operations. For longer time horizons to drive R&D, <clears throat> historic data is used as well, but here in conjunction with forecasts and the GAMP performance ambitions. One more click, and we see where the global air navigation plan is positioned in the overall process. And you see that the dotted arrows, they actually illustrate uh, that performance in fact, plays a role at uh, many different levels. Looking at the bottom here, I put the time scale of the blocks, uh, sort of to map uh, these uh, look ahead horizon. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, these are uh, the earliest availability dates, and it means the early adopters, they may uh, uh, adopt the blocks as shown here as the idea is that uh, things are deployed based on a performance need, uh, there is no obligation to be an early adopter, so people uh, may at lat later dates uh, implement earlier blocks. So what you see here in the gray uh, things. Uh, the performance-based approach in the ATM community, um, well, actually, um, uh, the term is used in different contexts. Uh, uh, in my speech here, uh, and I think in general in this session, we're not talking about the development of performance-based standards, uh, but about performance management at macro level. Uh, Europe started 20 years ago, uh, I think other regions as well. Today we can say that similar but diverse approaches uh, are in use across the globe. Uh, the role of ICAO is to promote and harmonize. Uh, and so for ease of reference, uh, I've listed here uh, a number of documents where you will find relevant guidance material. One is the uh, uh, DOC 9883, uh, the Manual on Global Performance of the Air Navigation System. It has two parts. Uh, part one, which is uh, uh, more about methodologies. The part two is more about uh, modernization and transition planning. Uh, we have uh, the Manual on Air Navigation Services Economics uh, in chapter four. It it uh, has uh, a performance-based uh, 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 chapter uh, as well. Um, uh, and uh, certain performance building blocks uh, are found in other documents. For example, the origin of D11 key performance areas is the GATMOC, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we have key performance indicators which are listed uh, in the GAMP. Um, I like to recall uh, some of the, you, or hopefully, in theory, everybody <laughs> uh, knows uh, uh, the terminolo terminology framework for performance, but it's useful to uh, recall this. Uh, um, the 11 uh, key, key performance areas, uh, they define the global categorization framework, uh, which is listed here. Um, uh, below that, uh, it is foreseen that you can define focus areas, uh, uh, which can be considered as sub-key performance areas. For example, um, if we say the KPA efficiency, horizontal flight efficiency, vertical flight efficiencies, uh, this could be uh, uh, focus areas. And these are not predefined. You can add as many as you want uh, uh, according to the uh, problem, performance problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, within the focus areas, uh, performance policy is defined by means of generic objectives. Uh, these define what should be improved under which conditions. Uh, when you add the when, where, and who in a specific uh, project, uh, these generic objectives become instantiated objectives. You, when in the performance-based approach, we say we want to measure whether we make progress, progress towards achieving the objectives, uh, well, this is where the performance indicators uh, uh, come in. You cho choose indicators which are appropriate to the objective that you want uh, to achieve. And at the bottom, you have the supporting metrics, uh, which represent all the data items that need to be included in the data feeds that you will use to compute the indicators. Uh, 
Uh, the blue are definitions, the yellow is actual data, so out of the data you compute the indicator values, uh, and then where do the performance targets fit? These are actually values of indicators that should be reached to consider the objective as achieved. Uh, how is this used in practice? Performance management is really a closed loop process. Uh, DOC 983 and DOC 9161 present a formalized approach for managing the process. Uh, I'll explain it briefly for the performance uh, manual to the right, but you'll note that uh, uh, 9161 process is in essence the same. Uh, step one is very important. It scopes the exercise in terms of KPAs, geography, time, time scales, etc., and defines at high level what the expected outcome of the improvement should be. Step two is basically the problem analysis phase, using techniques such as SWOT analysis uh, and prioritization. SWOT, by the way, is uh, strengths, weakness, opportunity, and threat analysis. The output is a list of concrete performance objectives. Step uh, three brings in the numeric dimension. It includes choosing the right indicators. Step four is then about choosing which solutions to implement to solve the performance problem at hand. Step five is where the actual implementation takes place. And step six is the monitoring and performance review, uh, which serves as the basis for restarting the cycle to see whether you achieved uh, uh, the objectives uh, uh, or to make further improvements. And uh, you see oh, the ANS modernization subject here uh, actually goes uh, from steps two uh, to step five. Uh, and uh, um, this is about selecting from the GAM the uh, most appropriate ASBU elements for the performance issues that you want to solve. Uh, so how does this uh, now uh, work? Um, um, and this is basically a lead-in to uh, Saulus um, um, presentation later. Um, uh, looking at the left side, we have the ASBO framework. You will recall uh, we have threads, we have blocks. The intersection between a thread and a block uh, uh, is, uh, is an ASBO module. On the right-hand side, traditionally, we have the 11 IKEA KPAs to express the benefits of ASBO modules. Um, now, GAMP 2016 has introduced a set of KPIs for measuring operational performance for the capacity, efficiency, and predictability KPAs. These have been successfully used for international benchmarking, as John and Marcos will explain later in this uh, session. New in the GAMP 2019 is the decomposition of the ASBO modules into more detailed solutions, ASBO elements. Uh, and the multi new multi-layer structure of the GAMP also foresees a performance-based decision-making method at the global technical level, which means in plain words, uh, how can states decide which ASBO elements on the left side to implement given the current and required uh, future performance levels which are on the right-hand side. So it needs to be a way to build a bridge between the two. So. Um, for the GAMP 2019, how are we trying to uh, incorporate this? Uh, the idea is to imp uh, tr introduce a performance objective uh, catalog, which serves as the repository, knowledge repository for all performance issues uh, that we come across uh, uh, from an analytical point of view uh, during GAMP development. Technically, it consists of a root objective, solve all performance shortcomings, and a number of top-level objectives each being decomposed into a number of sub-objective trees. Uh, now, all the Gantt KPIs uh, uh, are matched to one of the objectives, okay? Uh, meaning, also you start from a KPI, somewhere in the tree is an objective that corresponds to it. Likewise, on the left-hand side, uh, an analysis is uh, uh, being done uh, in the um, ASBO PPT uh, uh, to see which uh, 
to which of the objectives each ASBO element is uh, contributing. And finally, if you want to see uh, uh, how the mechanism from, uh, from ASBO elements to performance is, you follow uh, the hierarchical relationship between the objectives. And of course, you can just go up the hierarchy and then you see uh, uh, at higher level objectives where there are uh, contributions. And the advantage is, as, uh, uh, as the uh, this will be in a database and not anymore in a document that we will have sort of automated support for filtering uh, uh, and, uh, and selection. I'll explain this uh, with an example to you. I took uh, uh, wake uh, B01 for this, wake turbulence separation minima based on six aircraft categories. Uh, uh, according to the description, this ASBO element improves performance on both the arrival and the departure flow. And this is why in the drawing uh, you see uh, two branches of performance uh, objectives. Uh, um, if you uh, go from the ASBO element up the hierarchy, this is basically um, uh, analyzing how the benefits <coughs> uh, are delivered. And at a certain level, you will see, and usually it's a higher level, uh, that uh, there are certain benefits to one or more uh, uh, KPIs. Um, but when you actually want to know what exactly at the lowest and most specific level the benefit is, it is usually at something that is much lower than, uh, than a, a GAN KPI because the ASBO elements are at a much more granular level than the KPIs. Now going down, uh, this is then the analysis of needs. Uh, uh, yeah. This goes down the hierarchy, uh, and at each step, we have to ask ourselves, is there really a performance problem that needs to be solved here at this step? And the answer may be uh, uh, yes or no. Uh, uh, and uh, um, in any concrete case, there are only a limited number of performance issues, and using the performance objective catalog as a checklist will therefore automatically identify those uh, ASBO elements which are relevant uh, in your case. Um, to finish up, um, but this is perhaps more something we can uh, de address uh, during the discussion phase. I uh, uh, have a few advantages listed. Uh, suppose they're not new to you. Um, first of all, it puts the performance outcome first, uh, allows customer focus, <coughs> policy making becomes more transparent. Uh, promotes accountability. What I mean with that uh, is uh, if you're asking, uh, if you define an indicator or so, somebody has to be able to uh, uh, or accountable for actually the, the performance that's behind it. You can't ask people to improve something which they don't have control over. Um, it supports auditing of achieved results uh, and also it helps decision makers to understand where the real issues are, to set priorities, to make the most appropriate trade-offs, choose the right solutions, perform optimum resource allocation. Uh, uh, the more classic answer is, uh, well, a better choice of solutions, less technology-driven approach, uh, no, no more solutions searching for a problem to solve. Gives more freedom and flexibility in selecting uh, suitable solutions because uh, it's uh, less, uh, uh, less prescriptive. Uh, and last but not least there, uh, there's a significant uh, lever effect. We have to be honest, uh, applying a, a performance-based approach uh, has a cost. I mean, you need to collect data, you have to have the infrastructure, the data processing, the people uh, put resources behind it with know-how, uh, do the analysis and so on. So it doesn't come for free if you want to do it uh, decent. Uh, but in general, the European experience is that the resulting cost savings are a, an order of magnitude uh, higher than what you put in it. So there is definitely a, a business case to it. Uh, on the challenges, um, uh, I'll go quickly over that. Um, these are risks which uh, have to be kept in mind, and uh, uh, if people are insufficiently working together or stay in silos, uh, if uh, uh, you try to apply performance-based uh, approach but uh, with nested geographical scopes uh, can be difficult. Uh, you need to find the right balance between applying a qualitative approach if you don't have data and actually the quantitative-based approach. Um, 
is sometimes difficult. Uh, you have groups looking at performance monitoring only. You have groups uh, uh, performance planning, the forward looking. They need to speak, uh, talk to each other. Uh, it has been a challenge to establish the proper link, uh, like here ASBU elements to KPIs. Uh, uh, one particular problem is the lack of performance data standardization, um, uh, which in fact makes that we spend a lot of time and energy sort of like, uh, cleaning up the data, harmonizing it, uh, dealing with uh, quality issues and so on. Uh, um, and if you go for a quantitative approach, make sure it's meaningful. Uh, uh, measure the right thing that, uh, that actually has a, a correspondence to the problem you're trying to solve. If you do benchmarking, uh, measure the same thing everywhere. Um, solve your data availability and completeness problems and so on. Uh, and there are sort of the uh, uh, behavior um, things uh, uh, just to make you aware that uh, applying a performance-based approach might also have unwanted side effects that you have to uh, watch out for. To conclude, um, uh, I'd like to sort of recall the principles. Uh, it's a strong focus on results through uh, adoption of performance objectives and targets. Uh, uh, you, it allows you to do informed decision making, uh, driven by what you want to achieve, uh, and the idea is that you rely on facts and data for your decision making. And the critical success factors is please use a common language sort of terminology, establish a collaborative relationship uh, uh, between the stakeholders, uh, in particular if you need to uh, agree on future performance levels, targets, and priorities. Uh, uh, ensure that you have adequate performance measurement and data collection capabilities, uh, and then uh, have a process in place to achieve, assess the achievements periodically through uh, performance uh, reviews. And that was basically uh, what I wanted to get across. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hartmut, and I'm sure that uh, you can talk hours about this, and we want to listen to you hours on it, because the performance-based approach is very helpful for the whole system. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, so much time. Next part in this uh, story that we're telling today is uh, John Gilding, who will talk a bit about the FAA uh, key performance indicators and how they deal with it. John uh, currently serves as the manager of the strategic analysis group of the FAA ATO office of performance analysis, and he has over 27 years of experience in aviation planning, which includes over 23 years within the FAA. In this time, he has worked as a software developer, course instructor, and manager, manager of aviation projects worldwide. So really the correct speaker to speak about this. John, thank you. All right, thank you, Nico, and thank you all for staying here for the last session. And thank you, Olga, for putting my marker up here. So uh, my name is John Goulding. I'm, I'm in a corner of the FAA called Systems Operations. We work on air traffic flow and also have a performance analysis function there. And uh, I guess my job in this 10 minutes is to introduce you to the KPIs that are in the current GAMP and then show some examples of how we apply those at FAA. Uh, there was also a request to maybe talk a little bit about things we're doing to actually move these metrics. Um, once again, I'm part of just the air traffic flow group, so in terms of the bigger picture on how we're moving those metrics, I'm really grateful that Steve Bradford is sitting here in the front, because uh, there's probably, if there's any follow-up questions on that, uh, I'll, I'll be limited. But on the performance side, uh, I have been doing this for a while uh, with uh, my, my colleagues up here, particularly Hartman. So I've already messed up. There we turn it around. There we go. So just an introduction to the metrics that are in the GAMP. Um, I think this picture has been put up many times today. It's the GAMP 2016 document. And it gives a really nice, concise summary of 16 recommended KPIs. I know that sounds like a lot. They spanned, uh, but it is actually a trim down of, of what has historically been done. And they cover, these are operational measures, not necessarily safety uh, related like runway incursions or uh, financial, you know, cost per a flight hour, those types of things. These are the operational ones. And they're divided into what's called core KPIs. These 
were chosen to be simplified down to where you just need a gate time and a runway time to calculate. If you have those things, you can cover um, a lot of the basic measures about how your airport is doing. You don't need a lot of investment in some of these other things. But these additional ones do. Uh, this is where you're looking at delay by a particular cause code. You've, you've maybe identified the facility that's causing the delay, whether it's weather or runway construction. But um, some investment has gone into recording the facility, the causal factor. There's another class of metrics <coughs> that look at ideal trajectories versus actual trajectories. Um, of course, for this, you would need some capability of archiving trajectories and trajectory processing software, perhaps software that processes a flight plan to figure out how close uh, did your actual trajectory compare with a flight plan, those types of metrics. And then lastly, there's a metric uh, on fuel burn. So I ICAO does provide this very high level in the GAMP. Um, but if you want more information um, on the 16 um, KPIs, I think this slide also went up in an earlier session or a variant of it, there's a web link that ICAO has for more detailed information on the specific formulas and some examples of how you can calculate these things. It's not prescriptive. There's, uh, you know, there's examples in there of how a variance of, you know, depending on maybe this KPI is in your legislation and you can't change it. And, and I think that's very well respected in this GAMP resource page that it's really a concept uh, of questions that you're trying to answer. And that kind of gets into the why or the what. Why are we doing these things? I think Nancy uh, answered that or asked that question this morning. And when management asked me, why should we give your department more money to do this type of thing? Uh, it's, well, it's to answer maybe four types of questions you can have. Is that are we making the most use of the capacity that we have? These are kind of the block zero questions. Are you doing the best with what you have? And for these, you kind of have the capacity and the capacity efficiency KPIs that you see there in red. Um, what are the constraints in the system? Maybe you are doing the best with what you have, but you're still getting delay. You're still having um, places where you can prove. You're getting into maybe the block one and the block two ideas. These are the delay KPIs that are in those charts. Uh, they'll, they're delay. Uh, by airspace constraint, delay by terminal constraint, delay on the taxi out phase, delay on the taxi in phase. That's what these four KPIs are. Are we providing the most efficient trajectories to operators? Uh, these are things that get into maybe some of the environmental or the fuel burn ones on, are there things we can do that can minimize this? And these are the KPIs that compare an actual trajectory against an ideal trajectory. And for this, you would need trajectory processing software uh, to calculate these. And lastly, how do we respond to questions of schedule delay and on-time performance? These are the metrics that tend to make the papers. You know, on-time is getting worse. Um, why is schedule time between New York and D.C. going up when the cities aren't moving farther apart? Uh, that comes up a lot at ATCAs and forums like this. Well, that's KPI 15 kind of is these types of political questions that an organization gets on on-time and block time going up are, are answered by the ones you see in red at the bottom. So that's the uh, why would you spend money on this? Well, it's to help answer these four questions and hopefully make the case for investment in your systems. And at least that's the story I tell my bosses and, and maybe try to convince Steve. The, uh, now getting into the delay part, um, where you might be spending more resources on, well, that's great, but are you identifying where the delay is occurring? So in our FAA orders, when we hold aircraft, um, this is the type of information that the controllers are asked to log. Well, which facility is causing the constraint? There's a lot of argument on, okay, which facility do we charge for causing the delay? The airport, the TRACON, the center. What was the causal reason? We have about 40 causal factors in our FAA order. The high level ones are weather, equipment, runways, uh, volume, capacity. Staffing is not a formal one that's in the FAA order, but it's one we get asked a lot. I think it is more formal in the European uh, recording of delay where they'll record uh, staffing as a causal reason. How was the delay managed? Uh, did we go into a ground delay program? Did we uh, do a full ground stop? I'm not sure if these terms mean something or not. Um, but it's, it's information on how you manage the delay. What were the controllers and the air traffic flow people doing to try to balance demand and capacity? And then lastly, um, the minutes and the flights affected. That's the one that is, it, uh, you know, is, is our delays going up or down 
um, we would record the actual delay minutes. So that's um, an introduction to the KPIs and why we do it, and a little bit about recording the, uh, the investment we put into recording the delay. In terms of then charts that we would bring out later and say, okay, what's causing the delay? It's not surprising. A lot of it is due to the weather. Um, what might surprise people is how much of it is due to winds and uh, other conditions that you see here. Over the last year, we've had a big increase in delay due to runway construction. We've had some pretty highly uh, visible and impactful runway construction projects that have been impacting our, our delay. Where is the delay occurring? Um, uh, you, you can't tell it from this, but that 47% is our northeast corridor from uh, D.C., New York, Boston, Philadelphia, that particular area. So that area tends to get a lot of uh, consideration when it looks to, you know, are we mitigating, are we doing the right things. I'll, uh, well, I'll maybe come back to some of these. I got two minutes. So uh, on the trajectory measures, this is uh, the KPI 4 and 5 there. Uh, KPI 4 is looking at our flight plans distances going up, our airlines filing longer than they used to. And the green is, are they flying farther than they used to? Both of them compare uh, the blue flight plan against an ideal represented there by the red or the green, the actual represented by the red. And when we use this metric, uh, it does kind of cluster around places where we're flying extra involved special activity airspace. So not a lot of this is recoverable, but uh, airlines that pretend to operate in this area into Vegas and Phoenix and up around this um, are interested in this type of measure because it, it, uh, if, they f if they're landing with a lot of extra fuel on board, because they, they file farther, um, unload more fuel, uh, that, that, that's, that's the type of question my office gets on how do we track this type of thing. The other, um, you know, in addition to just our congested airspace is flying around thunderstorms. So this is from Atlanta to Chicago during March, where you pretty much can get direct flight between the city pair and then the June-July period, uh, where you can see um, this is where they're filing around thunderstorms and other things. Not all of this is recoverable, but when we do track these measures, um, things kind of cluster around, well, in the summer season, flight distances go up a lot, uh, and particularly in our Midwest here, and then around special activity airspace. Steve Urishin. Now, what are we doing to actually improve these measures? Uh, a lot, uh, at least in my office, is part of what we call airline engagement. Um, we have a lot of avenues where we engage with airlines every day. Uh, a look is done at the day before to look at some of these measures and could we have done a better job. We have monthly customer forums, end of season review, and then forums under what we call our RTCA. And I, I came from one of these actually just before this meeting. But this is, this is a big uh, deal for us. Um, improved pre-tactical planning. Uh, a lot of this is data mining. I think Nav Blue talked about this in the first session. So we're being asked to develop these data mining-like things that look back at past history and say, okay, when we did have wins at this particular airport, what strategies have we used in the past and how do they perform? How did we perform? So a lot of data mining tools. And then the last bullet here, uh, our, our Northeast Corridor Initiative. So that 47% you saw in the first slide, a lot of attention has gone into this particular area. Um, the big ones on the table are deconflicting the uh, streams of traffic into there. I think Steve Bradford talked about this earlier. And then tools and technologies that synchronize the traffic schedules. And Steve, you also mentioned that. So these are um, areas we're looking at to move those metrics, that 47% delay that you saw on an earlier slide uh, at, uh, at FAA. And so with that, I guess I'll conclude. And if there's any questions in later, we can handle it then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Very interesting and also good to see how the FAA is dealing with data mining and uh, with the dealing of the uh, key performance indicators. We now move to um, uh, Colonel Marcus Abroi, who will talk a bit about how in Brazil the cooperation with Eurocontrol is uh, helping solve some uh, problems they had in their uh, area. Marcos is a senior expert and he belongs to the Brazilian Department of the Aerospace Control, DCCAA, and currently develops his work at the Develop Deployment Commission of the uh, Aerospace Control System. 
He has an experience of more than 35 years working in the aviation field, and since 2007 he has been dedicated to the managing and deployment of projects related to ATM systems. He has developed his academic background in the following areas. Military logistics for the airspace, information technology, engineering for airspace system, airspace project management, and he has a great experience as an IT professor and project management. Thank I'm you. really impressed, Marcus. Right. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, ladies and gents. It's a pleasure to stay here. I'd like to toast your presence with a lot of thanks. And secondly, I am proud to participate of the, the CERO control team for the project capacity. And today, we all have this agenda. I'll talk a little bit about CEA, the project and objectives and scope. We'll talk a little bit about the initial results and so at the final summarize in the next steps that you are doing in Brazil. Uh, this is a central body of the Brazilian space control system called CCAB. Its responsibility is to develop, implement, to keep all the systems for HM in Brazil, including training of the, its, their personnel. Uh, the area that uh, its responsibility is almost 22 millions of kilometers square, distributed into, into five flights information regions, five ACCs, 59 towers, and 41 APPs. I brought this drawing to show you how our, our importance in South America, and I highlighted the Amazon, where the hard area to keep the systems working on. For example, our roads there are rivers, and sometimes you cannot navigate on them because of the floods or the lower level of the, of the waters. And our international relations with other countries have 13 fears uh, um, uh, around the country. And our natural leadership, you can see on the right side, is many flights from another country in South America cross over Brazil. Our integrated system is under, running under the same system called Sagittario and Sigma for planning. And the fence is under the uh, COMAI, uh, Strategic Air Command, and uh, uh, HC control is uh, under the CIA. All of them are, are integrated under the SysDacta. It's very easy and uh, to work under the same systems and uh, for HC. As you know here, they work like that. All the military and civilian uh, uh, flow working together and coordinated. Uh, the project objectives uh, was born in 2014 when the Sayer Control Maastricht, MUAC, ran a feasibility study to simulate a scenario with the following requirements. One, we is increased the echo production with less work hours on the console and improve their social life that we are finding nowadays in our world. The results of the feasibility study said, yes, it's possible if the same implement technology like time zone tools and sort uh, sector open table methodologies and roasting philosophies at strategic level and tactical level integrated centers. But it's recommended to see review the, the, all the capacities processes. And then, uh, in October 2016, the CRU control was decided to do a workshop in Rio to start the project when defined. The project plan and 60, 16 KPIs of GAP start in this scenario when it will be produced. Uh, this high level of the system comparison, you can see the geographic area. Uh, Brazil is very similar in, in Europe, but the numbers of NSP have just one, and in Europe we have 37. And the controlled flights uh, we have 2.1 million, and in Europe 9.8. The volume of the air traffic is uh, 150 of the rates in Brazil and Europe. 
because the average drops in aircraft movements in 2016 was about 20 percent but nowadays we are reacting we are, have the prediction for to increase 3.7 and a project scope we defined during that workshop. We, we observed that our system, Sagittario and SIGIM, was not able to, were not able to produce electronically 16 uh, indicators of the gap. And then we decided to do manually this collection and implement all the philosophies and methodology and sentiment, all of things using those KPIs, 6, 9, 10, and 11 and focus on the general system characterization subset and major airports, in this case 10 airports. Uh, right side you can see uh, uh, Europeans and the left uh, uh, airports in Brazil. Well, initially the results that we have found as uh, we are, we are uh, worried and concerned to reproduce the, the average of the capacity of, the, of our sectors in Brazil to implement uh, and study and improve knowledge about the SOT. And uh, we reach that, uh, we believe that next steps, we can refine more and more these indicators. The next, the 11, oh, sorry, the KPI 9, the peak arrival capacity. We highlighted that the peak arrival capacity for Braz SBRs, Brasilia, and SBJR, as uh, Guarulhos, Sao Paulo, uh, range about 25 lower to get to it, or 100 lower than Munich. Well, we analyzed the first few. We can see that Munich has two runways regulated. Then can, of course, and Guarulhos has two un not regulated because they have two landing, also time different of the landing. Then we compare the movements for per hour of arrivals. It's uh, very similar, this Guarulhos and Munich, and the uh, difference between them is for Munich is uh, three or four movements per hour. Then uh, we arrived here as so of KPI 10, airport peak arrived through SPUT. Well, uh, Brasilia, which uh, exhibit, exhibits a very wide variation of arrived through SPUT and offset of the peak through SPUT. A similar behavior and Europe observed and I'm Mr. Dan, which operates the multiple inbound and outbound banks. Of course, in the number of connecting flights, the same like uh, Brasilia. We can observe in Brasilia the same, uh, same behavior of the AM. But the most important of these results are compared in country, regional. We separated by three groups. In this case, a group of Right side, you can see a uh, SBCT is Curitiba, has the the, the best uh, practices, best performance of those airports of the same class. Then we are last month we implemented uh, ACGM at São Paulo. We have more airports in the national wide project. Uh, so we can facilitate to spread this best practice for another airports. On the other hand, we can see the group of the, the left group of we, where we have São Paulo, Guarulhos, and Brasilia. We can observe that the true sput in, in São Paulo is very f strong. And this, we can observe that the capacity that there is a very small and the, the demand there is very high. Then they created more facilities. Then we have to stood better to implement for another airports. Well, the, the next is uh, KPI 11, arrival capacity utilization. We can observe that the show lower peak arrival through put for the Brazilian airports. These airports exhibit higher capacity utilization. In Europe, uh, the declared capacity is typically higher but less frequently used. Of course, this, uh, <coughs> this indicator is managed, the, 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 the characteristics, the features, the limits, is by ANAC, the Civil Aviation Agency. It works together with them. And, but uh, the first view that you can see there is a uh, capacity as uh, the, all the airports are very close to each one. And normally you have the heavy season of rain and it's used for to support another airport in contingency situation. 
Well, summarizing uh, the next steps, we continue to do the, the collection data, right? And you go into the right up face and uh, show the report for to PRU and DCIA. And uh, we are preparing to, to show this report and, uh, for the Euro Control Provisional Council in the first, first quarterly in 2018. And we are preparing to implement the 16 KPIs on the our system Sagittarius Sigma. In the same CGNA or any mock, uh, we have the new performance structure, as I can see here. In all the bullets and rule it for to implement the new functions and new work structure that you can see here. CGNA is our NMOC, Network Management Operational Center. Well, that, that, there's a, they you count with the technical level, with a statistic sector to process all data daily. And then they send this information to another part expert. We will analyze the information and send to SGOP, the Subdirector of Operations, Sub Department of Operations, in the Strategic Eleven policy, apply the remedies to solve the, the bottlenecks, and the return to the CGNA to apply and support the remedies for on the bottlenecks. Well, the, our architecture of KPIs will work like that. You pick up all information from all say, uh, Sagittarius of spread around the ACCs, and our APP Sagittarius 2, and Tower Tech can send all information to Sigma Flow from uh, Sigma Planning 2, and create a database, and we will calculate all KPIs electronically. And you have, uh, plan we are planning to conclude this in the final of the next year, in early months of 2019. And I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you very much, uh, Marcos. And uh, very interesting to see how the comparison between two regions can help you to increase your uh, capacity and uh, get more data and analysis on it. Our next speaker is uh, Salah da Silva. Uh, I think we all know him. And he will talk a bit about uh, the ICAO toolkit that will be introduced uh, very soon. I have here a bio of Salo, but I don't know how to tell it. Salo started as an air traffic controller, but after getting bored, he became an engineer. <laughs> what does that say about air traffic controller? I can say that as a former pilot. Um, he finished his master's degree in air transport engineering and moved to air traffic management development and implementation of the Brazilian ANSP. He joined ICAO in 2007, so apparently he is not bored here yet. In the ATM section, is now Chief of Global Interoperable System Division. Saldo. Thanks, Nico, and good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I'm not bored. Not yet. Uh, working with these guys like John, Harmut, Nico, Marcus, much smarter than me, so impossible to get bored. In other sections, uh, we heard some comments made on uh, related to difficulties in access information related to the GAMP. And then my boss said, man, you have to go there and tell them it's not that hard to find information. Tell them what we are doing. I say, okay, let me go there. And then somebody said, you have to talk about gangs and spas. And I say, gangs and spas, what the hell is that? Gang police spa, not the place where the girls go to do the nails. Uh, but you have to talk about that. So that's why I'm here, to talk about gateways and system performance assessment. That's what gang and spa uh, means. So the gangway that we call, that we are developing to save some time of you when you try to understand what Nico, uh, sorry, what uh, John and uh, Harmut said, because sometimes when I was listening to these guys back, I don't know, a long time ago, a long time ago, uh, I didn't understand what they were saying, because I was used to do implementation. That was my job, to implement things. And just reading, I could not understand. So when I came here to IKEA, they said, well, one of your jobs related to the Global Navigation Plan is to make easier to understand 
these things called key performance indicators, key performance objectives, data mining, and other things. So that's what we did, and we're still doing actually, because what I'm going to introduce to you now, it is still on the development. We'll be ready soon. It's what we call the gateway, so, or the gangway. So the gangway is just the global air navigation gateway to the technical level of the global navigation plan. In this portal, you'll be able to find what we call the Vision System Block Upgrades Framework in a web-based application. Forget the 400 pages that we have produced today. This application will have several different features, and I'll list some of them for you. For example, you can derive reports, You'll be able to filter operational improvements by area of the navigation system, by time frame for when they will be available, by the phase of flight they are designed for, or the planning layers they will impact, among other things. You'll also be able to find necessary components like regulations, procedures, ground systems, avionics, to implement this particular operational improvement. And you also see uh, the ICAO's work program that you'll be linked to it. So to ensure that the necessary provisions that we have to provide to all our states are developed on time to allow the implementation of the necessary regulations to enable the operational improvements uh, to its maximum benefits. That's our goal. Also in this portal that we call the gateway, we'll be able to find a tool that's important because this has been requested by several states to support the states and any other stakeholders to analyze the needs of specific operational uh, environments and identify optimal solutions for them. That's why it's a, a menu of options that you can use to tailor the solution to our specific operational uh, improvement. So this includes the operational improvements in the aviation system block uh, upgrade framework, and that's the name of this tool we call the SPA, the air navigation, uh, air navigation system performance assessment. Both of them, the gateway, the gangway, sorry, and the SPA, they are still under development. So what I'm going to show you now, it's still under development, but at least you have a notion of how they look like when finally developed. And it will be available soon. We are in the final stage of development. So from the gateway, that's uh, the portal that you have in front of you, from this portal we have access to the two main aspects of it. It's the ASBUS framework and the navigation uh, system performance assessment support tool. Let's start with the, the ASBUS framework first. Here you can see all the elements of the framework. You see, for example, now we have ACAS B0 slash 1, that means element number one of the uh, ACA thread. And this, in this uh, portal, you can have the opportunity to filter them. Let's say, let's filter for block zero, for example. We have the blocks, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, you can filter for blocks, so block zero. Uh, for phase of flight, let's say, taxi out, uh, phase of flight, and you apply the filter. So, applying this filter, you'll be able to see all the uh, available elements since 2013, because we, f we uh, filter for block zero, so block zero, initial date 2013 for availability, so we have since 2013 that affects this specific phase of flight, tax out. Let's see another one, for example, another example that's airport CDM element block zero uh, dash one. So in this uh, page of the portal, you can see the description of all the elements. You can see uh, the purpose of the element, the capabilities, the description of itself, and how it is uh, in terms of development, the maturity level of uh, development. And you have also the dependencies and the relationship between all the elements. So, and obviously, if you want to refuter, you can clear the filter. For example, you can clear uh, B0 filter, eliminate B0. Okay, so if you clear, you have all the elements available that we have uh, up to date. And you can clear all filters. If you clear everything, right, you're going to have all the elements back there, so you can start filtering again. So, and this is also will indicate how this relates 
to the air navigation work program that we have and also the industry developments. That's where we'll find all this information. Let's see another example that you can show the element number one for meteorology, the AMET uh, B01, if you can launch for me. Then you can see also, if you, can you go there to the AMET B01? So you can see, if you go to this element, you can see all the enablers that are necessary to implement this particular uh, element. We have all these enablers that, imp that relates to regulations, uh, avionics, ground technologies, uh, and other uh, provisions, everything that you need to make this available. This shows for us the commitment by all the stakeholders to make this operational improvement available by that time. That's how we control the availability of everything that is necessary to show. So you see that there are some dependencies between uh, the different elements sometimes. Another way to see the dependencies, we can see all the dependencies in a graphic format. That's uh, it's an interesting, uh, uh, interesting way to see the dependencies. I mean, you can highlight the dependence between the different elements, what's necessary, uh, if you want to implement one element, what is the relationship between this element and another element? This is just a graphic way to show the interdependence between uh, the elements. We also have a way to show you the performance benefits of the element. You can go there uh, to the performance benefits. Okay, so they are there. The performance benefits of the elements by a series of performance objectives that each element will contribute uh, two, the associated key performance indicators, so I mentioned again the key performance indicators and the key performance objectives, and the deployment applicability of this element. You'll be able to see all of that. This part is still under construction. I cannot show you uh, right now, but you can, you will be able to see that soon. So if you go back to the portal, and we're there now, go back to the portal and run the air navigation system performance assessment you find what Harmut just mentioned in the first presentation, the six steps method to help you to identify the optimal solution to a need based on your specific operational environment. When Harmut was, was uh, talking, I was thinking to myself, I said, well, you know, only reading what he's talking when the document that he mentioned, Doc 983, is really hard to understand. This tool was developed exactly to facilitate the application of this method. That's the idea of the system uh, performance assessment tool that we develop. For example, if you select one of the environments, let's go to the TMA environment. So for a medium term, we can select a medium term time. And uh, you can see, and well, obviously you can select which region, because different regions, they have different uh, uh, data that will be used for run the tool. So for each region, you select your region that you are located and the key performance area you want to, to uh, analyze, uh, you can select different key performance areas. You, you can have a menu of key performance areas. You can select some of them. And you have, in a sequence, you could, if you continue, you can go continue, you're going to have a sequence of uh, questions that will guide you towards finding the optimal solution to the problem you want to address. It's tailored to your needs. We are not providing a solution for all problems. You will define the problem you have. We are just facilitating your, your tool. At the end of this, you go keep a series of questions. You can answer to these questions. And at the end, yeah, you go ahead with the questions, answering everything. And at the end, you have a list of performance uh, objectives of potential performance objectives. And why I'm saying potential? Because this can be selected by you according to your needs. We are not saying that these are all the uh, potential objectives, the, all the final objectives. They are potential objectives. You'll be able to select the one according to your needs. If we continue with that, the tool will provide you also a series of key performance indicators associated with the selected performance objectives to quantify these objectives. We define the objectives and we quantify. In the performance step, if you keep going, uh, in this performance uh, step, you'll find the operational improvement in the framework that applies to you. 
In this case, you can see there, based on taxi, uh, it is, I don't remember now the phase of flight, I guess it was taxi out, if I'm not wrong. If Oh yeah, sorry, the environment uh, is the terminal area. You have two uh, elements in block zero and block one that can help you to improve operations. So you go there, you select, and you will uh, have the ones that applic applic are applicable to this specific operational environment. And you also will find the necessary information regarding this particular element here. You can see that if you open, uh, open one of them, yeah, you have the same information that you have already seen, you have already seen uh, before. And one of the, before the last step that we have, before the last step, you find also the guidance you can move, okay? You will find some guidance on how to perform a safety assessment, an environment assessment, and also a cost-benefit analysis that will support the decision. Why we are saying, why we are showing this step? Because sometimes you have a perfect technical solution. Everything is perfect, that's what you need for a technical solution. But then you have to do a cost-benefit analysis to see if this is, from a cost perspective, is the best one. Maybe we can find another one that will also solve your problem uh, with a much better uh, cost-benefit uh, equation. So that's why we have at the end to perform this and you have the guidance in the, the, the tool as well. So the last step that is still uh, under development uh, will remind you on how to assess the benefits post-implementation, post-deployment. This is also very important because when we deploy something, normally we just deploy and forget it. We don't know what is the impact of this implementation at the end of the day. So it is important that tool gives also, people are killing me because of the time, but it's important to analyze also uh, which are the benefits that you really achieved with this deployed uh, solution. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this portal is still under construction, but we are sure that it will be available soon. It's in the final stage. I would say that more than 95% is already done. And, uh, and this will basically, this is basically a tool to help states to identify the optimal solution to solve their problems. The clock is going down. She's showing me 20 seconds. She thinks I care about the time. Uh, that's the last thing that I care. But anyway, but I'm at the end of uh, what I could <laughs> show to you in this short uh, period of time. Uh, we are available, obviously, we have a group of people behind this development. We are available here during this week or whenever you, you want to ask us questions about the tool, the development of the tool, we are ready to answer your questions and attend your requests. So thank you very much for your time and uh, see you soon. Thank you very much, uh, Salo, and uh, I see you're still not bored within ICAO. You really uh, are dedicated to bring the thing, and I'm sure that everybody will start playing with it as soon as it's online. So now we uh, end up with a um, presentation by three experts talking about uh, the African Flight Procedure Program, that is a consortium uh, working uh, in Africa. Um, it's Mr. Zoho. Uh, Prostwer Zoro Minto, and um, he has been serving as the international civil aviation community for 32 years, including ICAO, IATA, and ASECNA, and has actively been involved in major programs aimed at the implementing global air navigation and safety plans in Africa, Indian Ocean region. He will be assisted by uh, Ambassador Philippe Bertou, um, who is the permanent representative of France in the ICAO Council since August 2016. And Philippe has joined the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs almost 20 years ago and since then has held a wide variety of diplomatic positions around the world. Most recently he spent four years in New York as a member of the permanent representation of France to the United Nations. He was first councillor and political coordinator for all negotiations in the Security Council. Ambassador Batou is currently chairing the ICAO Council Committee on Unlawful Interference. And finally, but not least, uh, it's Mr. Bankinun, uh, Louis Bankinun, and he is the Director of Operation of ASECNA, the Agency for Air Navigation Safety in Africa and Madagascar. ASECNA is an international air navigation service provider in the AFI region, 
belonging to 18 states and covering 16.1 million square kilometers. Mr. Ban ki is working for this ANSP since 1989, and it represents more than 28 years in civil aviation. Um, I start with Prosper, and he will uh, introduce the other speakers for the whole presentation. Prosper, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nico. So at this time, I think it will be the last presentation, and uh, I will meet the challenge of making it with my team <laughs> more digest at this time when uh, our energy levels are heading somewhere, <laughs> upwards or <laughs> downwards, you choose. So. Um, our presentation is about uh, what we consider uh, a success story uh, because it's a s setup that help the African region to uh, implement the highest GAMP priority in the area of air navigation. Uh, though it also support uh, a number of key performance areas which Saolo just uh, alluded to, uh, which include access and equity, which include uh, safety, capacity, environmental protection, uh, and so forth. So, <coughs> in uh, short, we consider uh, the AFPP, that is in short, the African Flight Procedure Program, um, a sustainable program. Um, it started in terms of its launch uh, in June 2014. It is based in Dakar, hosted by uh, the ASECNA, uh, which is an ANSP for uh, 18 states. Uh, the technical support, administrative support, is uh, provided uh, by ICAO headquarters with mainly the Air Navigation Bureau and uh, the Technical Cooperation Bureau and uh, obviously the ICAO regional offices that are based in the AFI region. We also have the involvement of the uh, uh, African uh, Civil Aviation Commission which is the African Union uh, Aviation Wing and we have key donors that is France, uh, and uh, Airbuses. Um, it is run by the uh, seconded experts, permanent experts, and experts intervening on ad hoc basis. And the funding mechanism is based on uh, uh, contributions by member states. The ob overall objective is to support the implementation of uh, PBN, as I mentioned, through capacity building and uh, other forms of assistance. Um, it's basically, uh, it, it is uh, basically based on the uh, assembly resolution. Uh, there was assembly resolution 3623 uh, in 2007, and uh, later on assembly resolution 30. Uh, seven, eleven, setting implementation goals. And uh, to address the issue in the region, we had a recommendation from the 28 uh, special air navigation, uh, regional air navigation meeting uh, called Special Afiran 28 to see how we go about it, about uh, a PBN implementation in the African region knowing the challenges in terms of, uh, of uh, expertise, in terms of uh, equipment. And when I say expertise, it covers at regulatory level and also in the uh, specific area of flight procedure design, uh, mainly based on PBN. Uh, you have the stakeholders, which include the states. They are categorized. We'll see it in the next slide. The role of ICAO, I've already mentioned. In terms of donors, I mentioned already uh, France, Airbus, ASECNA, uh, but on ad hoc basis, there are uh, other states uh, like Cote d'Ivoire here, Ghana, uh, Kenya, uh, 
um, uh, Tanzania, uh, I mentioned, who are providing uh, secondments on, on an ad hoc basis. The expected uh, outcome of the program are two main uh, uh, outcomes here. We have the, to enhance the capacity in the area of flight procedure design and the regulatory approval, as most of requirements of uh, Annex, uh, Annex 6. And then we have operational uh, improvements. The setup. Uh, basically, the program is governed by two, uh, I would say, frameworks. There is a letter of intention signed between the ICAO, uh, France, and ASECNA. That was in uh, 2012. And then we have the, the program document, uh, which the participating states would sign as active particip participating states that, or user states. And then we have the category of, uh, of donors, which I've already mentioned, that support the program in terms of providing expertise, uh, equipment, funds, or uh, otherwise. Um, at this stage, uh, now that we have the setup, may I call upon uh, Excellency, Mr. Bertu, to let me shift to the office. Yes, to, to take over. Thank you very much. Yes. I will take it from, from here because we don't have a lot of time for transitioning. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, on, I, I want to say uh, that you know, we consider AFPP as a, as a great success and we've invested uh, a lot nationally in this, in this program and I want to share with you some, some lessons that we've taken from, from it and in order also to frame the future, future stages of the, of the program. Uh, you've mentioned, uh, Prosper, the, the various uh, uh, the, the categories of participation uh, into the programs. What we think is really what, what is extremely important in this program is the spirit of partnership. It's really the DNA of, of the program. And I think our common uh, presentation is an illustration of that. It, it worked because there was really a, a, a genuine uh, commitment to work, to work together, and it, it, including at the, at the political level. So that is extremely important. Second, I think the, the status of, of donor was very useful. It did not really exist in other uh, FPPs uh, previously, and it could inspire some, some future developments uh, of, of FPPs. Uh, and, and the fact that, for example, you mentioned Airbus as a donor is, I think, uh, a specificity of this, of this program. And which could be uh, developed and, uh, and implemented elsewhere. And uh, third, uh, I think the, the user state status also is something that contributed to the success of the program because uh, states could uh, start to test the benefits of the AFPP expertise for their, for their needs uh, before or uh, instead of, uh, at, at the initial stage, uh, investing as much uh, as, the a, uh, as the APS. Uh, the active participating states. And that created, uh, to use a, a very local metaphor, a snowball effect that also contributed to the success of, uh, of, the, of the program. Turning to France, uh, I, I just want to illustrate on the, the, the support we've provided to the, to the program. Uh, it is not, certainly not, uh, the intention is not to put it forward as a model, but as an illustration. But it's clear that the more donors we can have in this program, the better it will be for, for the program. Uh, this support has taken uh, the form of a very close partnership uh, with involving the DGAC, our French uh, uh, authority. Uh, for civil aviation, uh, who participates to the steering committees and uh, has shared with the FPP during the phase one a uh, long experience of uh, implementing a PBN. Uh, second, the uh, Ecole Nationale de l'Aviation Civile, uh, very well known, I'm sure, in the room, uh, which is a, a very important, a key training uh, partner for ICAO. Uh, and uh, ENAC provided licenses for Geo Titan automated procedure design software and uh, different kind of trainings, of course. And then uh, the French PEM rep uh, to the ICAO Council, through which uh, the funds transitioned and which, uh, uh, of course, played a role in the uh, administrative and budget uh, support. So the total contribution of France is uh, roughly 1.12 million US dollars since uh, 2013. And let me now go to, to some, some lessons that we've taken from, from this participation and engagement. First, uh, we have also been uh, on board the Asia-Pacific FPP 
uh, program uh, from its beginning. And the fact that we are participating in two uh, regional FPP programs has given uh, us, uh, we think, uh, a good overview of the challenges, uh, of, uh, of the common challenges that the programs can, uh, can, can, uh, um, can fight. Second, uh, it's, tr it's clear that FPPs are states' programs before all, and they belong to the states. But uh, for us, no FPP is sustainable without a very strong, very dedicated involvement of ICAO headquarters and of uh, regional offices for ensuring coordination, support uh, within the programs. Uh, and so we thought it would be useful for us to have um, to better coordinate our technical assistance with all the FPPs and with ICAO HQ. Uh, to try to mutualize resources, assistance across uh, across the board and the regions uh, in these two programs and maybe in, in the future in the Middle East region. And so we've, uh, we're working on a larger agreement uh, with ICAO and we hope to, to conclude it uh, uh, with the organization and in cooperation, of course, with the program managers as uh, very, very, very soon. And it, it is very important, I, I think, because AFPP is now entering into a new phase, phase two, or, uh, after the, the success of phase one. Uh, we will remain a very close partner to, to the African FPP, but uh, in, a broader, uh, in a broader setting, the, the one that I've just uh, illustrated. A AFPP for us, with the phase one, has uh, taken off with a great success, but we have to transition now uh, uh, to the to the cruise phase, which is the the phase two, and for that uh, a very strong commitment of the partners, uh, including again at the political level, is extremely important uh, and will be crucial. So with this, I, I close and thank you very much, and I hand over to Louis. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ambassador. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very happy to be among you and share with you experience of uh, ASECNA, uh, service provider in uh, AFI region. Uh, since Monday morning, uh, with the opening of GANIS and uh, now SANIS, we had many presentations talking about te technology. That is uh, to, uh, uh, to strengthen our system. But we in Africa, we say that it's important uh, uh, to begin by coordination, by cooperation, and also uh, to help each other uh, in order to, uh, to, uh, uh, to strengthen our system and allow all our state uh, to be at the same level. Uh, coming up uh, to uh, this uh, presentation, this common presentation, as you can see, uh, uh, Nico said, ASECNA is uh, 18 countries in all Africa, uh, and we manage this airspace in only uh, five FIR. That means all the 18 uh, states have accepted to put, in uh, to put together their airspace. When we, wanted to, when we want to implement uh, nav ads and all requirements, and all ICO requirements, we don't look uh, to the border of states. We just uh, follow only the technical and uh, uh, the operational uh, issue to implement, uh, to implement this uh, NAVID. Our vision in ASECNA is to work for all AFI region based on full cooperation with other ENSPs, with ICAO, with IATA. That's why our, our board has accepted to us uh, AFI uh, procedure, uh, AFI flight procedure program in Dakar. All the facilities have been given to this, uh, uh, to this uh, office, suitable office space and furniture, including maintenance and repair. A new building, as you can see down on the slide, uh, has been uh, built and will be operating next uh, February uh, 2018. It is located near ICAO Regional Office uh, uh, in Dakar. ASEGNA possess also its own uh, Pants Ops uh, office uh, with eight experts. And uh, together with uh, the, the AFIF flat uh, program procedure, we mutually perform quality control of the design procedure to validate the, pro the delivered product. 
a signal got also an aircraft uh, which can fly, uh, which can check uh, in flight the procedure design by, by, by the office. This aircraft also uh, help uh, all the AFI region uh, in uh, calibration to calibrate the, the NAVID. In addition to AFP, which is for all Africa, uh, ASECNA also uh, are focusing on data sharing with other service provider. We heard now NAMA uh, before us. Uh, we talk about uh, about uh, this sharing. Uh, two weeks ago, we signed a, a NEMO with uh, ATNS in South Africa in order to uh, in order to continue the interoperability of our two network, uh, SADEC network and uh, uh, ASECNA network. Together also with uh, ATNS and uh, Council, we perform also a peer review mechanism for the ENSPs. Uh, we have already made uh, the, the, the audit of ATNS and also ATNS have uh, done the same for, 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 for our signal. With Nigeria, Ghana and uh, Roberts FIR, we are using the same network. Uh, in few in few weeks, uh, we are going to sign an MOU to share data between uh, our uh, our free ANSP between NAMA in uh, in uh, Nigeria, GCA in Ghana, and uh, ASECNA uh, in the other sea. We have also implemented, as you can see on this uh, map, an AFISnet uh, station in South America, which allow us today to link all the area in AFI region with the South America. This is uh, a kind of sharing together uh, the resources in our region. To conclude, uh, I can say the full collaboration between provider and the implementation of interoperability technology between neighbor centers are the key to mobilize resources, work together in a cost-effective manner to improve aviation safety so that no country will be, will, uh, will be left behind. I can assure you that ASECNA will continue supporting global initiative aimed to put together resources in order to build together the African single sky. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador uh, Philippe Bertou and uh, Louis Bakeno. Um, we are going to, to conclude um, the membership of the um, AFPP is, is displayed in terms of uh, active participating states, user states, um, the, the donors. Then we have the program, as I was saying, the funding mechanism is by states contributing 10,000 uh, USD uh, annually. And uh, there are also uh, some products from the the projects developed by the AFPP. Uh, the map shows uh, the, the development of uh, PBN plans in Africa. Key achievements uh, are through workshops. 42 African states have benefited from workshops in the areas assigned to the program. We have training courses, 22 states and organizations with 25 experts trained in, on uh, conventional and PBN uh, procedures, uh, PBN approval, uh, OPS approvals, 90 experts, and OGT, uh, five uh, experts. And then we have assistance also uh, to many states uh, through, uh, throughout uh, Africa. There are some additional programs uh, in which the program uh, is, is in, uh, the AFPP is involved. That is the Airbus uh, Showcase, supporting global implementation project, and ICAO EU uh, CO2 uh, emission reduction, and uh, some uh, uh, project in the region like in DRC. We said uh, we are telling a success story. This is in some figures. We can see the progress uh, according to the um, assembly resolution implementation goals where we can see that the AFPP has performed above the global average according to the, the, these dates. 
Phase two was mentioned uh, for, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that we still have to, 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 to progress implementation in PBN, but also the assessment by the steering committee of the AFPP of the performance of these results uh, uh, led to a go ahead for uh, phase two, uh, which is now uh, being, being prepared, the, the, the project document for phase two and the administrative arrangement for, for the personnel and uh, uh, other issues are being addressed. So the target being that in the first quarter, uh, let us, let us, that is, it can be in January, in February, phase two will be uh, operational. Um, the process of recruitment is, uh, is, is ongoing. So this uh, concludes this uh, presentation. I think uh, I thank my teammates. And... Uh, also, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Louise and uh, Prosper. We had a lot of uh, information. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much time for questions, but um, I will uh, have two questions if you have any questions for uh, this audience. Uh, just raise your hands and then there's a button in front of you on uh, on the desk. Is there anyone who wants to ask? Farid, thank you. If you state your name and what you do and so people don't know you. Thank you, Nico. Uh, my name is Farid Zizi and I am uh, with the French DGAC. Uh, what I do, uh, working on a number of things, including the GANP, let's say. Uh, my question would be to, to Prosper, uh, and, but more generally on the GANP implementation in Africa. And uh, I, I see here a very good example of a cooperative approach. And to provoke a bit Hartmut, uh, I was not too, totally sure that the methodology of performance assessing that he presented was totally adapted to the case of Africa. And the other thing I want to point on is that we tend to look at the GANP for American and, and Europeans a, a bit, uh, where I think myself that Africa would be a very good client uh, for the GANP uh, because uh, you you need uh, future technologies, you need airborne uh, uh, cap uh, capacities because you have uh, difficulties in the jungle, in the desert, for in remote places to, to make some ground facilities which have been uh, the ones supporting the, the air navigation in the past. So what is for you key in order to perform well and implement the GANP in Africa? That would be my question. Thank you, Prosper. Uh, th thank you, Farid, and pleased to meet you again. Uh, I thought you will, you, will, you will help me answer a question now you are asking that one. And I will, uh, I will reply in, uh, in, uh, at two levels. The first is the global level, that is how to facilitate or enhance progress in, in implementing GAMP requirement. Um, there are, I would say, generic issues after some surveys, um, either formal surveys or through regional meetings. Um, we have the issue of guidance. Uh, that is, the, the concept of ASBUS is, is well understood. Uh, the modules are well known. But we have the issue of the applicability of the modules. They have been categorized. You have essential modules. There are nine of them. You have those that are uh, desirable. That is, the benefits are demonstrated, but they are not, I won't say mandatory, because there's no mandate. But you, you know what I mean. And then you have those that are specific or optional, uh, specific uh, meaning uh, uh, they apply to some environments we have identified, for instance, South Africa, where the level of traffic is, is, is very, very high, where you can implement specific modules. Now, all in all, we have identified nine 
uh, modules under block zero uh, that are in category one that is for immediate implementation and the others that are uh, in priority one. The challenges are now applying to PBN. They are the issue of the expertise. The concepts are relatively new. Uh, and the training program, the workshops to not to sell, but to have the same level of understanding and good knowledge of what is involved with, with these modules uh, is, is, uh, is, is an issue because the, the pace at which we provide these workshops uh, or trainings is very slow. That's why under P the PBN program, I mean the, the AFPP program, we are trying to catch up. You would see a number of modules address this issue, though it is specific. To, to, to PBN, but we need the same approach across the, 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 the module elements. The second issue is we don't have, uh, I would say, comprehensive gap analysis. Because this, from this gap analysis, we would identify the priorities. That is in, in addition to the categorization I mentioned, but the priorities in terms of implementation so that we will focus on these priorities and now address the third challenge, that is financial resources. I mean, we cannot uh, avoid it, though there are some arrangements, the FVP is one such arrangement, where resources are, uh, are being pooled. Uh, there is uh, human resources uh, with expertise, with uh, fundings, and the commitment uh, of the state. These are a few I can mention to, to answer your, your, your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, looking at the time, one short question from someone. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Thank you. Uh, it's the questions maybe to all of you, um, because the GAMP, you know, was designed to more or less provide, you know, um, modules applicable for every regions and every types of situations when the time come. And so my question to you is, if there are any missing elements in the GAMP, you know, something that you need to do which is not addressed by one of the modules. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to answer that? Yes, I found it. <laughs> um, we, uh, in, in terms of statistics, uh, what do we have in, uh, in the portal? I think we have at the moment um, block zero and block one, something like 120 plus uh, ASBO um, elements. Uh, we have uh, a little bit less than 20 KPIs. And in between, this performance objective catalog uh, is, at the moment, although it's still draft, I think it's over 600 uh, objectives. So it's a pretty thorough analysis, okay, uh, needs refinement, uh, supposed to be something living. But the idea there is that uh, it, encounter, it sort of lists all the things that you can encounter. And for sure, uh, not every objective has, has a solution uh, in there. So actually, you can use uh, uh, the objective catalog to say, OK, here are certain things for which the GAMP, uh, 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 in terms of solutions, doesn't offer anything. So maybe we need to add something uh, there. Uh, likewise, of course, it doesn't make sense to have indicators for all 600. So um, it's, uh, I think uh, one has to use it in a creative uh, way. So in that sense, uh, uh, I think this is maybe one of the uh, useful ways of using this. Thank you very much, and I uh, would like to uh, close the session by this. I think we had a very interesting day today. Uh, started with session one, where we talked a bit about the continuous growth, and especially boosted by new entrants, and uh, the vision that we cannot... Uh, do extrapolation from the past because that's not an option because we have new entrants and new uh, technologies. Then in session two, there was the question that we really need close cooperation with all key holders and all players. And then I remind uh, a bit of uh, Ms. Popicoso who said in their opening speech uh, yesterday that it is important to get the political will to have uh, this uh, support to get everybody uh, working together and the resources uh, done. Session three, we talked a bit about the transition, that it's challenging, but also give uh, huge benefits. 
The state should encourage innovation and optimize the use of available technology, but be careful not to use technology because of technology. And we now had the uh, uh, panel talking about the advantages and the disadvantages of uh, performance management, of modernizing the air navigation services, and the importance of analysis and uh, data mining. Uh, and we have uh, very good examples of Brazil and uh, Africa where cooperation uh, brings you uh, further. I think um, tomorrow we go further uh, with uh, two more sessions on this storyline that uh, Olga told, uh, talking about collaboration and sharing of best practices. And then uh, the second is uh, the positive impact of a national development plan. But uh, for now, I would like to uh, thank uh, my panel of uh, experts. I think uh, we really had uh, a lot of information. Thank you for staying so long, because it was a lot of information. I hope you can uh, digest it all during the reception later and uh, during your sleep tonight. I'm uh, looking forward to see you tomorrow. But please uh, help me in uh, thanking uh, my panel for their work. And before I close, I think Olga wants to say something. Um, yeah, thank you very much to all the panelists and the speakers and the moderators today. It has been great. And um, thank you for you for staying that long and uh, for uh, attending this, uh, this stream. Unfortunately, there is no reception today. Uh, so we will have to just sleep on the ideas and catch up tomorrow. And uh, I hope I will see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock where we will have the last two chapters of uh, this story. And uh, thank you very much for today and enjoy your evening in Montreal. Bye. Thank you.